and welcome to The Last Looks Podcast, a show where we catch up with talented hairstylists and makeup artists in the film and television industry. We'll pick their super creative brains and find out all the good stuff. Join me, your host, Jamie Lee, in finding out what's what in the hair and makeup departments around the world. Now it's time for Kit Corner, where we shine a spotlight on artists who've created products with the film and television industry in mind. Products designed by artists for artists. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Jamie Lee. How are you doing? Hey, good. Now, you are a professional makeup artist and you've created a pretty handy product to quickly and easily remove stubborn lipstick. Tell me a little about yourself and your product, Lip Loofer. Yes, well, thank you so much for having me on. And um, like you said, yes, I'm a professional makeup artist. I have been freelancing for about 13 years now. You can imagine I've been always looking for new ways to make my job easier. And I have created this really exciting new product called Lip Loofer. Lip Lufa is an individually wrapped finger swipe. So they're sanitary. It's like a little sleeve that goes over your finger and it removes pretty much anything on your lips from lipsticks to stains to glitter. And it also exfoliates at the same time. So you can pop them in your set bag and open them as you need, one at a time. You just slip it over your finger and you swipe that look right off that model or talent's face. And it doesn't leave behind any oily residue so you can immediately go ahead and apply the the next look that you're looking for and it won't smudge and it won't smear. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what other artists think of Lip Lufa. That's awesome. What was your inspiration for the product? So, you know, last looks can sometimes mean last look changes, really. And that's exactly what happened to me and how Lip Lufa was born. I was on set, last looks were called, they wanted to change it, so I ran in there and it was, a, of course, like a bright red lip tone that they wanted to change completely to the model's natural lip tone. So in a very short amount of time, I did the best I could and I thought, you know, I really could use a lipstick remover, like a lip wipe right about now, something to erase this color. And that's it. That's when Lip Loofer came to me. I love it. So what makes it ideal for professional artists? Yeah, because the idea really struck me while I was on set. I think it's ideal for other professional makeup artists because I know I'm not the only one who's had these moments of like crazy pressure where you just want to do a really good job. And then all of a sudden, you know, they at the last minute, they, they want to change the look on you. I hope that other professional artists will, will get use out of it because I know that I will whether I'm on a fashion show or I'm doing a commercial lipstick change, like I said, or even at the end of the day, if your talent just needs to swipe it off. That's very cool. I think it's going to speed up those quick changes so much more. Taking that deep red lipstick off to then apply a natural lip will be so much faster. Thank you. And honestly, that's my goal. You know, any time saver that we can do as artists, I think just makes us even more hireable and that's my goal is to help other artists like you know be more hireable and badass <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> i love the efficiency <laughs> thank you does it have any um fragrance or taste it does have a fragrance or taste um to be honest that i feel like was one of the biggest hurdles because you know everyone has a different idea of what they would like to have you know in their fragrance or their flavor so i created a yummy sweet mint so i have organic stevia and some peppermint oil so it's not too overpowering and it's not too sweet but it's sort of like the perfect little refresher to go ahead and swipe that color off and exfoliate at the same time that's great so where can artists grab lip loofah goodies well i'm really excited to announce that i am selling lip loofah exclusively on our website so it's www.liploofah.com and as a major gratitude and thanks to you and everybody listening you guys can go ahead and use a discount code for 15 percent off at the checkout, just go ahead and pop in last looks 15. So it's not case sensitive and just go ahead and say last looks 15 on www.liploofa.com for 15% off. That's excellent, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. (laughs) 
Today, I'm speaking with Ivana Primarak, the hair and makeup designer for films such as Billy Elliot, Atonement, Cold Mountain, and Darkest Hour. Ivana is also responsible for recreating the likeness of the British royal family on the Netflix series The Crown. We chat about her training under incredible artists, becoming a designer herself, and the traditional techniques she has used to get that period correct look in her films. Picture up. Last looks. Rolling. And action. Welcome to the Last Looks podcast, Ivana. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Hey, um, I would like you to finish this sentence for me, okay? Okay. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a girl named Ivana, and when she grew up, she wanted to be... A makeup artist. You and did? A makeup and hair artist, yes, I did. <laughs> That's it's- so brilliant. It's, well, it's a bit of a long story. Um, it was, it's a long story because I grew up in um, then socialist Yugoslavia in Croatia, in Zagreb. Mm-hmm. And I was raised by very academic parents and I have mm-hmm. a very academic sister. And yeah. she always knew that she was going to do something with English literature or literature or whatever. And her path through school and schooling was very, very clear and always driven by what she needed to do and, you know, exams to complete. And she knew she was going to go to which university. Mm-hmm. So I coasted through a primary and secondary school being completely an average child on a kind of a higher spectrum of an um, average child but I never really studied. I was very playful and I dreamt a lot and I was, you know, a dream up type of (laughs) child rather than an academic child. Mm -hmm. And soon the time came when then in our educational system, which is very similar to Germany, you at the end of secondary school, you kind of have to decide what university you'd like to uh, go to. And then you have to do exams and blah, blah, blah. And I just couldn't figure out what I'm interested in. And and that became a real problem because I knew there was only one path in this whole thing. I couldn't take a year out. I couldn't go traveling. That was completely not possible at that time where I grew up. Mm. And and then I spent, I sort of spent a year thinking, what would I really like to do? And and I really, really obviously I think I really applied myself to this because it became quite, you know, I was quite burdened by the fact that I just didn't know what I was interested in. Yeah. And because my parents took us to the cinema a lot all the time and theater and all of the arts were very available to us. I remember that was the time when Dustin Hoffman did like a loads of movies uh from Papillon to um um God, what's the name? Um the one who, where he plays a woman <laughs> completely. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. Um... <laughs> and, you know, he did loads of, he, like, he did a movie a year and mm. he always looked very different. Yeah. And and I was like, who does that? Who? And quite recently I looked at all those pictures and he actually always looks like Dustin Hoffman. But I was mm. so <laughs> impressed. And so I kind of read the credits and there, was, there were the credits for makeup and hair people. Mm -hmm. Um, I was not interested in hairdressing at all. And I was interested in transforming people. Yeah. And so I begged my parents, I was too young to leave or to do anything. And I begged my parents to, if I studied for a year, so I enrolled in the um, University of Law for a year. And then I said, look, could I go to London and see if I could get into the BBC because they had the training program. Mm -hmm. At that time, you could apply for the BBC. And if you get if you got in, then they trained you for five years. And then, you know, you go through the apprenticeship that way. Wow. So I studied for a year in which I slept on every surface possible. As soon as I opened the book, I'd fall asleep. It would be (laughs) on the table, on the chair. Everywhere I was, I just fell asleep every time I opened the book. I actually passed three exams, which were most general exams, Mm -hmm. um, history of law and stuff like that. So it became clear to my parents that it wasn't lack of intellect that made me. It was just (laughs) total. I just was not interested in um, studying. And my dad, who was a judge and a lawyer, and my mum was a judge, which in former Yugoslavia meant the equivalent of a teacher rather than, you know, if, if I was born here, I would have been a very different uh, type of uh, uh, person. Mm. Uh, and so that meant they couldn't really afford anything that I wanted to, to, to come to London and study here and go to the BBC and all of that sort of stuff. So yeah. I, 
you know, they just thought, well, we better let her. And let's see, if, you know, is, is there a job of a makeup and hair? You know, they're obviously the credits and stuff and we watch them in the movies. But let's go and see if she can get into the BBC, what the situation is there. And I had an English teacher who moved to Zagreb from London uh, because her father was Macedonian, sort of a vague kind of connection. So she was a native English speaker and she had family here and everything. And so I lived with her mother in Wandsworth and arrived to try and figure out if I can apply for a job at the BBC. Well, that without the internet and all that sort of stuff was, you know, obviously took a lot longer. But what became apparent is that you have to do this absolutely shockingly, shockingly long process of interviews. Something like 3,000 people apply and they take five people. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it was like, and this happens every, and this happens, um, it, at that time it was once a year and it was in the summer. So mm-hmm. I persuaded my parents to stay. I worked in different bars as you do in restaurants and stuff and saved money. Mm-hmm. And then I found out that what you really should do to go for this interview, because it's a practical thing as well, what you should do is do a course before because if you go cold you know mm. you're not going to be you're not going to do very well although they train you they wanted you to have certain knowledge and I didn't have any hairdressing training or anything yeah um, but that wasn't stipulated that you should have it but anyway so I thought okay well I'll do a course and the best course at the time was called grease paint it was run mm. by a makeup and hair designer uh, who was at the BBC for many many years Julia Crottenden and she had some like six students. And I thought, okay, I'll do that. And the course was £1,000 then, mm. which is now equivalent of, I think, like 15 or something. I don't know what these courses yeah. are now, like 15, 20,000. And my parents from Socialist Yugoslavia were like, well, we don't, we, we don't have £1,000. So mm. I decided to obviously save that. But then all, the whole of this process, all of this is now taking another year. So mm-hmm. I've decided to, because I was having too much fun working at Chicago Pizza Pie Factory and all these different <laughs> bars and restaurants in London uh, and spending money and stuff, I decided to go and be a nanny in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. And I thought if I live with a the family, then I'll have all the movies, I'll have toilet paper, I'll have toothpaste <laughs> and I'll have food and I won't be going out and I can save every single penny and then I'll come back and do the course of Grease Paint. And that's exactly what I did. had an amazing time. It was hard work. It was a bit boring, but I loved the family and the kids and everything. And then I enrolled in the school, saved the money, got the money, got the place, returned to London and did this course, which was absolutely amazing. And the teachers from the, the, you know, the, the people who sort of ran the course were all ex-BBC or people who still worked at the BBC, designers who did shows from comedies to period dramas uh, from the news to and I thought that was genius because obviously the film world was quite limited to you know people doing films where people at the BBC at that time people did most amazing comedies and um, they used loads of prosthetics and stuff and wigs and all sorts of things and that's when I realized that if you want to really truly transform a character a person Mm. you can't do it without changing their hair and that's when my interest in uh, hairdressing started. And it was slightly unusual, I would say, because you start, uh, I went through the theatrical way rather than through hairdressing. And later on, years later, I met people like Peter Owen, who I worked with many, many years. But, well, we can talk about that a bit later as well. But he <laughs> kind of did the same thing. He kind of was self-taught and he taught himself how to transform people through just learning how to do the film side of, you know, film craft rather than salon craft. Yeah. Um, So I kind of embarked on doing the same and um, then finished this course and applied for the BBC and went through the three and a half months um, thing. Mm. And at the end of it all, I, I think at the end of it all, I started working at the first amazing makeup shop in London called Screenface. Okay. And it was run by an amazing, again, a BBC makeup designer and her husband, who was an art dealer, and he decided the makeup artist didn't have 
good enough makeup boxes and stuff to take their kits to set. And he made mm. the first metal modular, those black modular black makeup cases with silver corners yeah, and, big, yeah. and big trunks. And they only okay. sold that. So I got a job at Screen Face mm. uh, helping being a shopkeeper. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I was doing my application at the BBC. So did the whole thing and finished, and then they tell you when you're going to get a letter Mm -hmm. uh, letting you know if you got in or not. And I got a letter from the BBC on this particular date, and I opened it and they said, you got in. You are Ah. would like to tell you that you are the one of those people who got in. The next day, my phone rang, and it Mm. was the head of the BBC at the time, Mm. and she said, we made a terrible mistake. It wasn't you. It was another girl. And you got a letter by complete mistake. So we're Oh, we're with- my <laughs> goodness. And I thought that my world has just ended because what is now my position? What can I? But now I've been in England for two and a half years, six months in Washington, D.C. Yeah. I've spent all this money and time. You know, I I can't go home. What do I go home to? And Mm. the whole thing was just, And but I was working in the makeup shop, surrounded by makeup people. And, you know, somehow there there was, you know, I was getting somewhere, obviously. Yeah. Um, And funny enough, this particular, so what then, slightly today, sorry to digress, but very soon after that, uh, BBC dis- dismantled uh, their makeup and hair department. This was the mm. last school that they ever took on. Mm. And they basically, BBC as an institution, that's why I really wanted to be part of it, was the most socialist way you can ever work. You know, mm-hmm. they you became a member of a situation where they they give you all the work. You don't have to you don't have to try and compete on an open market for any work. You yeah. are their staff and you get placed on the news or the comedy program or Last of the Mohicans shot in Scotland. So those are the kind of things that I thought that's how I wanted to work. But of course, all of that became old fashioned. All of that became very costly and this dismantled the whole organization very, very quickly. And one of the last people uh, that worked for BBC at the time was Jan Sewell, who is an amazing makeup and hair designer and Mm-hmm. She's a very interesting person to talk to because she um, also has knowledge of both both of those worlds. So I knew kind of a few people through coming to the shop and I thought, well, what I'm going to do is going to do exactly what the BBC would have done for me. I'm mm-hmm. going to do for myself. What I'll do is I write to all these people and try and work for free and be their assistant and try and learn that way. Now, at that time, that was very possible. Yeah. Now that's not possible for many different reasons. Mm-hmm. And also I don't encourage it. I always make sure that everyone who works with me has a paid position because it's yeah. just not <laughs> not fair anymore. But I yeah. did start like that. And I luckily met people like Naomi Don, who I'm still great friends with, who um, gave me um, my first job on Great Balls of Fire which is a film shot in London because it was about a concert that happens in Hammersmith um, mm-hmm. Apollo and we shot it there and everything. And I was one of the, I don't know how many young kids she could find to kind of come and help for free. Oh, cool. And then, you know, I started working with her more and more and more. And then little by little, I met more and more people and started working with them. But in the meantime, in this shop, one day, this lady came in, and I knew who she was because she was a head of makeup and hair at the BBC. And she said, I recognize you. And I said, yes, I'm the girl that you had to send the letter. Because oh I have kind of a very prominent mole on my lip. And she said, I recognize that mole. And I said, yes, I'm Ivana, and you send me that letter. And I nearly died. Yeah. And, <laughs> and she was very, she was a sweet lady. I mean, you know, by then kind of almost retired and everything. But it was quite funny that that happened, that I could actually be face to face to her and tell her how devastating that was. Mm. But also I then, you know, I could work in the day and then the days I got jobs, I could ask them to give me a day off and kind of try to learn that way. And that slowly worked. That's awesome. I'm sure that the woman who had to call you was not looking forward to that phone call either. (laughs) 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, it was a total bureaucratic um, mistake. But of course, mm. when there's a letter in the stamp and someone posts it and there's a wrong name, you know, they're all just mm. names of kids of the same age. You know, now it would be an email, you know, and also you could sue them probably or whatever. Oh it, was all, it was all pretty <laughs> simple. They just send the wrong letter out. And when they realized, yeah. they quickly made that phone call. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, oh, yeah, that would have been, you would have been in, uh, up on cloud nine and then bang. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But anywho, you, you made it but through. it all so. started. Exactly. But it all started <laughs> up. So I was well on my way because it took, took so long by then. Yeah. But uh, at the end of the day, I mean, you obviously wanted to do it. Yeah. Like you worked hard to get there. So it yeah. shows that you had a passion for that direction that you were going in, which is brilliant. And yeah. also that would have um, impressed your parents as well, I'm sure. That would have been well, like, yeah. oh, she really wants to do this. <laughs> She's still working at Chicago Pizza Pie Factory at night and at Screen Face in a day. But <laughs> oh, wow. So uh, what was your first job that was kind of like, um, I guess, a, a full-time paid position on a film or TV? One of the first jobs I ever did was a crazy film called Billy the Kid. And this film, and I'm not sure that we got paid. I have a feeling that was still a free job. But it's the film that opened Prince Charles Cinema in London, which is still there on Leicester Square. Mm. And they show very weird or old films. And that, like they now show things like Room and stuff. And they opened the whole cinema when it first opened with this film called Billy the Kid. And it was okay. about a man who sleeps with a goat and ends up having this monster that kills people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did that. <laughs> you must have and, been on set going, what am I working on what? Right now? But people who were doing Billy the Kid were amazing young people who did Hellboy and all sorts of things as part of yeah. the presenter, uh, like Neil Gorton and people like that. And that's mm-hmm. where I met them. And oh, that's cool. so, so they were already working in the industry as very, very young junior prosthetic people. And this is, this was obviously clearly we thought we were going to get somewhere with this. Mm-hmm. And it was, I am sure now I'm going to show my lack of knowledge of history. Um, Berlin Wall came down when mm-hmm. we were in the middle of the film and I went with friends that I met on that film. We all went to Berlin after film stopped shooting. So it must have been, that must have been 90, 89, 90. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the wall came down then. And so that's that was the, so then after that, um, I somehow uh, got a first pay job as a, as a junior assistant with amazing woman called Sue Milton at Granada mm-hmm. Televisions and they did shows like Sherlock Holmes. Okay, cool. And I started working on Sherlock Holmes in 19 something, two or three or four with her and they they did series after series after series, they're all per- obviously period and they were amazing because they were hour long and at that time you shot one episode for something like six weeks. Oh, and wow. And you prepped for two. So between every episode, you had two weeks prep and you went to London and did all the wig fittings at Ray Marsden's at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember always thinking, why doing wig fittings when they put something elastic on someone's head and take it off and it bounces back into shape? Uh, And then you have second and the third fitting. You know, he was very old fashioned, Ray. Had like Mm -hmm. three fittings. And the wigs never really fitted, but um, that's how it was done at the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, they were amazing. They're still amazing uh, in yeah. lots of ways because, you know, they still make incredible wigs for lots of different people and everything. But mm-hmm. that system, I think, it was clearly, you know, it was clearly overdone because there were budgets for all of that. Yeah. Um, so people were traveling with actors from Manchester, from Granada, down to London to do these three fittings on every actor wow. for every part, which now, you know, of course, to us seems... Um, Could you imagine? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then that's where Sue Milton, or she wouldn't ever, ever recycle any wigs either. And they were sometimes brand new because they were used like once or twice. And she'd had this 
huge cupboard full of wigs and we go like, oh, look, this is dark wig. We need No, it has to be made from scratch because, again, she could mm. because they had the budgets. So that's what I did mm. for quite a few years. I did Sherlock Holmes and then met Jenny Sherko, who I worked with for uh, quite a few years after that. And I think that was the most kind of um, developing part of my career, really. Yeah, just working on different different types of projects and yeah because she's so I mean I was very very young when I first started with her and obviously eager to learn and she's such an incredible designer she never does anything um twice the same Mm -hmm. you know she pushes herself completely and her whole team and everything and I was just going from one project to another with the same designer was pretty amazing because you know you could really learn you could steal I mean I I always I always say I was like I felt like I was stealing knowledge you know I was just like watching everything <laughs> and going oh my god you know what a great idea and or you know and collaborating with her like that so closely was you know incredible, incredible. yeah so, and then the last thing that we ever did together was Elizabeth okay uh, which is probably you know one of the most perfect films uh, I still think to this day um, and she of course won the Academy Award for that. It's beautiful. It, beautiful. And I was so, you know, I'm still to this day proud to have been part of that team. And, and yeah, she was just incredible. But, again, that was a long prep. <laughs> I think that's what we're missing is long prep. Yeah, I think so. I had heard that Jenny um, has the, I don't know if it's luck or what it is, but the, that she's able to actually do fittings for all, like personally for all the background and things when she does yeah. a film I mean, like that, yeah. which yeah. is amazing Yeah, to be able to be given that time to be able to actually see yeah. and design every single person that's going to be on screen. That's yeah. incredible. And she somehow, you know, obviously when you have the time and, you know, she'll pop in on everything and she'll, yeah, she, she will look at every picture. She will be there. You know, she will, she will also start the crowd call in the morning. We yeah. will start the crowd call every morning, even if you could help with one or two background, but she would be there then run mm-hmm. back to the trailer, do her artists, then run back. Then, you know, it was never left alone. She would be all over every single bit of design, which is, it's amazing because it's a support for everyone. Yeah. But it is also part of that incredible prep time that you can do all of that. Yeah, that's amazing. So you're coming up through this. I mean, uh, so many of us learn on the job. I mean, you learn your basics through a yeah. course or whatever. Exactly. But, um, at what point do you feel like you really understood wigs, working with, with wigs, with lace front? Now, that, that's a very, it's a very good question because it took me a very, very long time to become Jenny's first assistant. Mm-hmm. I would say since the beginning till the end, it was probably 15 years. And I always say what we do is a little bit of a university degree. You know, we, we just do it, you know, and I, I, did, I did a theatre show with an amazing Peter Shepard who was huge in West End in theatre. And I remember I couldn't dress anything. Everything was falling apart. I had to learn how to do stage shows. You know, it was like, that's not the same. It wasn't the same way of working. But to answer your question, when I did a film called Mary Riley uh, with Jenny, I had to do a wig that was completely up the back, up the sides, and nothing across the front. So all off face and the right. back. And yeah. the bun was on top of the head. So it was like nothing to hide from anything. Mm-hmm. And she gave me this task, and it was a really quite hard film for um, Jenny because it was, you know, a lot to do and just a big film and um, one of those uh, not easy projects. And I somehow, I can't remember why and how, but I remember th- thinking about it as a little jigsaw puzzle, thinking about Mm -hmm. it that every hair has to be in the right place in order to cover or to go in the right direction to do uh, what it's supposed to do. And I was doing that like to the point of, you know, I became totally obsessed. Now, Peter Owen was doing John Malkovich on the same uh, project. Mm -hmm. And he wandered into our makeup room one day and said, who's doing this wig and I said I am he said I don't think I've ever seen anything as 
perfectly done or as well or you know something it was a huge compliment and I was like oh my god that's just like floored me (laughs) and he said well because everything on these wigs is going the wrong way nothing I was like what do you mean these are the only wigs that I know and this is the only way I know how to do and he said well that is because your boss Jenny Sherko requires you to copy nature when you don't even know that you've been asked to do this for the last eight years or whatever you live along you work with her. Mm-hmm. Um, you get a wig, which is not perfect. It doesn't have all the right directions and the right rules. And because you don't know, you know, because you, you, you you're not a hairdresser. So mm-hmm. what you're doing is you are copying nature and that's what he tries to do in his wigs. He, yeah. that he puts all that into his wigs. Uh, and I learned with Jenny because if you did something that didn't look natural, she'll say, well, it's your fault. You need to do it. You can't say, we couldn't say, but that's the wig you gave me. Mm-hmm. All the wigs were pretty not done in the way that Peter Owen makes them. Yeah. And now they're all very different. But at that time, he was a pioneer of that technique. Mm-hmm. And um, Jenny would require you to put that work in. And so I learned that. And I would say then on Mary Riley, I thought, okay, I think I am, I, I think I can understand now what it requires, what it needs to happen. It's yeah. all the prep on the block. It's all the, you know, you can't just leave it and put it back on the next day. It's all that nightmarish work that you need to do after everyone's gone home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think that was the time that it was, it was Peter Owen who highlighted to me that I was doing something that I didn't even know I was doing. Yeah. And that's amazing. And that would have been, I, I'm assuming just through your training and being told, Oh no, maybe change that. It needs to be going yeah. this way, whatever, whatever. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I actually had this conversation with Rick Finlater, who, who I adore, yeah. <laughs> who worked with Peter Owen and Peter yeah. King on rings. And he said that that was the one piece of advice that really stuck with him was Peter yeah. Owen pretty much yeah. just saying, you you know, to copy nature, you know, look at the way that the hair grows, uh, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, you know, and make it do that. And funnily enough, Rick had said the same thing to me. He had passed that yeah. knowledge on to me. And I think the first time he was talking about, he was talking about facial hair. And I remember yes. him getting right up in the mirror and going, yes. come over here, look, look at the yeah. direction that my, my beard yeah. is growing in, look underneath my chin, look how it grows, yeah. you know, it's growing up and over through here. And, you know, and yeah. then of course I just naturally took that into hairlines and exactly. hair growth patterns and things like that. And that's really stuck with me. And it's, yeah. it's so funny to me that I hadn't thought of it before. Like I felt really stupid after he'd said it to me because I was just like, why am I not, why is that not clear to me? Why did it take someone to actually say that to me? (laughs) Well, because it is, I think it's because it is apprenticeship what we do. And, and, you know, Jenny would say things like, you know, Jenny would say things like, well, where is the root shading? I'll go, I don't know. You haven't given it to me. And she'd go, well, the hair doesn't look like that. You need to paint it in. And I'd go, okay, well, you could have told me, you know, in your head, you're kind of being a <laughs> petulant child every time. But that's what she would constantly do and bounce your actor back to your chair and bounce your actor back to you. I mean, you know, that was, I, I don't actually know that we do that so much nowadays. I think it may, it's all very different. But then it was constantly returning your acts back to you and going, you know, fix that, fix that, which mm-hmm. I'm so grateful for now because oh, yeah. that's what she was doing. And then so... In fact, I, rec- I met Rick on um, on that Lord of the Rings uh, stint out there, um, and he's just he's just one of the world's best you know people to know and and best <laughs> artists. But we did share a lot of those kind of conversations about you know what we owe Peter Owen because you know Peter Owen would say to me that maybe he thinks that not having hairdressing training uh, like him, uh, mm-hmm. having to learn everything maybe is a blessing because a lot of people he finds, a lot of people when you when they sit down in, in, in your chair, people pick up a brush and comb hair backwards because mm-hmm. every hairdresser in a salon will do that. If you do that with a wig, it's never going to work. You're changing all the directions. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people, and then since then, I noticed that people put a wig on a block and off they go, they go, all the hair gets combed backwards 
Yeah. And now it's set backwards. Now it doesn't have, it doesn't hinge itself back into a natural direction like on your head. Yeah. And that's what Peter, I remember Peter telling me that. And I never really understood that because I never noticed it. And then when he told me, I was like, yes, people, and still sometimes people will come and do days with me and stuff or younger generation and stuff who have learned from different people mm. that they would do that sometimes. And then you have to undo it. You have to go, well, if you let the wig dry like this, it will then mm. stay like this and you won't mm. be able to change any directions. And yeah, so Peter Owen figured all that out sitting there in some theatre by himself in Bristol Old Vic, knotting wigs all by himself for like 15 years. Wow, it's so amazing. I mean, and that is, to me, when I'm watching something, will be a dead giveaway very yes. quickly when, yeah. say, the hair through the temples is kind of yes. just going straight back yeah. or yeah. the in the middle yeah. of the forehead up that yeah. front, it kind of the hair's growing back yeah. and then comes back around back forward around. and it's like oh no 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 hang on no. and it, it it is it's what catches your eye because it's it's something mm. you don't see in nature People's exactly growth patterns don't work like that so exactly. it, it is those subtle little subtle little details things. that make a big big mm. difference and every time I think, you know, oh, God, with, you know, with a lot of changes in industry and the lack of prep and the lack of in the speed of shooting, that will become a dying craft, you know, mm. uh, you know, wig application and wig. But then then you look at, you know, people are so busy and there's actors flying all over the, the world and the hair is not correct or gets chopped or doesn't get chopped. And you go back to having lots of wigs on a show that you didn't think you're going to have. Yeah. So really, I think it is not at all. You know, I think it's developing and there's great, far greater need for it more and more, really. Yeah. Uh, I think it's become, uh, I feel like in my personal yeah. situation, um, yeah. I feel like a lot of productions don't understand the time someone yeah. needs to prep something like yeah. that just yeah. you know like if you're getting to the end of your day and yeah you have to take that wig off and it needs to be yeah. clean and you need to wash yeah. it and reset it yeah um that that needs to happen and yeah. you've got you know transpo starting to unstabilize the trailer and yes. you're like no, no guys come on just yes. <laughs> if yeah. I don't do this right now yeah. I'm going to be fighting it all day tomorrow and it's yeah. not going to look right. It's just, so true. You know, yeah. and you're working as fast as you can, but it's yeah. just, yeah. It's that, I, I, I feel that constant struggle of just constant. needing yeah. the time to, yeah. I think That's there's true. this thing of that wigs are going to be faster or something. And it's just like, well, in some places, yes, but in then some, in other, yeah. other ways, exactly. well, no, I need the time after the actors left to reset exactly. the wig. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. That is very true, actually. You're right, because that's the because as there's less and less period shows in America, for example, then productions think that then you'll be fast and you won't have to deal with all of they don't want to deal with all of that. Yeah. Like, you know, if you're doing, you know, something like Little Women that I was involved with setting up and dealing with um early last year, then they're prepared for it because they know there's all these wigs and it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be it's the other extreme of it all you know yeah. then but when you're doing an ordinary show people constantly like you say they're constantly turning on they're turning off the power going right we're gonna move yeah. trucks now <laughs> <laughs> oh, I God. definitely learned to um figure out how I oh it was so so terrible like just needing to just say oh okay well I need to take my hood dryer home and the wig and dry it and do this it. at home because yeah this isn't <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> which you know shouldn't be happening but anyway it shouldn't be happening exactly and that's what I learned because you know I did a few films in the US ages ago when I first mm -hmm. worked there and that's what I would be doing and I'd be crying every night into 12 wigs because I was I would take them all home because they needed to be washed yeah and you know and the pressure on on the team was that we have to go home yeah so yeah all of that all yeah, of that tricky. is difficult oh <laughs> god <laughs> So tell me, how did you end up um, heading down to New Zealand for some Lord of the Rings shooting? Um, so then, so yeah, so after I met Peter Owen um, on Mary Riley and soon after that I started designing my own shows and I started with very, very, very small films 
But every time there was a need for a wig, I started asking Peter to do it with me. And I've never worked on a show since that he hasn't made for me. Oh, wow. So we became incredibly close. And then I worked on, so he asked me to go to New Zealand with him uh, to help him on uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, and then after that, on a few other films like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Sweeney Todd. So, yeah, I did that with, with him. You know, I would always do everything he always asked me to do. Yeah. But, yeah, so I headed down to New Zealand and that was an incredible experience in itself. That's brilliant. Now, also, I noticed that you did The Hours and Cold Mountain with the lovely Kerry Warren. Yes. So <laughs> that – so he became <laughs> – he became a very, very close friend the minute we met on the hours. He came straight from another production that he did with Nicole, and we were very, very quickly asked to not stand together on set because we would laugh too much. <laughs> I know, it's trouble. We were totally <laughs> reprimanded. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant! So that was amazing, and that was very, that was great fun, and that was you know that was also a producer Scott Rudin is very into wigs and into you know like do they look right or not right and everything is particular, and he was everyone was having kittens about Nicole's makeup and the hair, and no one's ever seen her not glamorous and blonde, and how are you going to do this gray hair and everything, and and Kerry was just he's always the same. He's like, well, we're just gonna put some gray hair on her, you know, it's like, but he is, I would say Kerry Warren to me is one of the few people in this world who can do high fashion, who can do amazing, realistic and period films and the highest of all glamour. You know, he's one of the most versatile people I think out there. Yeah. Um, I really, you know, every time I work with him, I just think, but he's also the funniest and the nicest and um, so, yeah, so we became very close friends and he also lives almost across the road from me. Uh, oh, brilliant. In London. Oh, so yeah. I see him, I see him a lot, but he's <laughs> so, he is a total genius. Yes. So then we did Cold Mountain together, which was amazing because that was six months, six months of work and we were in Romania together and stuff. And then we did Grace of Monaco as well together. Oh, wow. So yes. we went, yeah. So we went down to South France together oh, uh, brilliant. for a while. Yeah, he is amazing. I did listen to the podcast you did with them. They're amazing. No. That was <laughs> so good and so informative. And Morag, my God, yet another. I know, um, she's brilliant. Genius. Yeah. So the work that they've done on that. Um, I was going to say, just with mentioning these locations, so you've shot in quite a few places around the world. Um, nice. What would be your favorite location that you've shot in and maybe your most challenging location the most challenging location definitely is Romania because of the lack of food and all the resources that you need when you're shooting for such a long time you know they're very very they were challenging uh I think eastern Europe is a very challenging location yeah. um but you know I, I don't know I mean I love I love all the films that I've done in the U.S. um they were always interesting. I loved doing Extremely Loud, Incredibly Close in New York City. That was sort of, I still think New York is one of the best places to shoot a film in the world because of all the, you know, everything, all the resources you get, amazing mm -hmm. crew that's just there. You know, everyone in New York works so much and they're so skilled at all, kind, all kinds of projects. So I would say I love shooting in New York and I also love shooting in in Philadelphia uh I, this I just am halfway through um the project there but which is my I think fourth project there because I did oh, wow. a lot of a few films with M. Night Shyamalan who won't shoot anywhere else but in Philadelphia it's interesting <laughs> so yeah <laughs> I think we should all do that. What's he like to work with? Well, he's he's incredibly young. So you get, you know, so you get that kind of youthful leader, director, person, because a lot of people that we work with are not young. So I suppose when you get a 35-year-old, then he's obviously older now. There's a sort of energy and an amazing thing that comes with it. But also at the same time, he's very, you know, he's he does his films the way he does them and you have to just do you know like he does a storyboard and he only shoots the storyboard 
Wow. So if there's a shot of a foot, he won't change it. There'll be a shot of the foot. There won't be. So it's incredibly easy to follow what's going to happen next because you all get a storyboard. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it can be a little bit frustrating when you can see other opportunities and you can see, you know, there's other ways of wanting to tell the story. Yeah. But, you know, you know, he'll shoot in Philadelphia, which is very comfortable, and he's always at home. And, you know, so there's – he's – he's um particular director yeah that's it's quite incredible to have that vision right down to that yeah smallest detail planned <laughs> yeah I mean I, the most I mean probably the most amazing experience in that sense was working with Peter Jackson you know seeing mm-hmm. how he's created this family atmosphere that shot together for 10 years all together with the hobbit <laughs> yeah. you know it was it's incredible it's absolutely incredible to me to see how well everyone got on how the process worked and how you know your fittings your this information everything was sort of kind of on a highest of levels i should say that i don't think i've seen since really in lots of ways yeah, I think Rick said to me when going, because when he did Rings, and then I said to him, did you ever see yourself going back to Middle Earth for The Hobbit? And he's like, yeah. no. He's like, but it was kind of like the same recipe, just baking a different cake. Yeah. Like uh, the, the way that they work, they've really, you know, yeah. it's a well-oiled kind of machine exactly. that you just kind of step into and it's it's go. Yeah. 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 Rick said 100% no. He will never, ever, ever in a million years go back. But I think part of, but I think part of, you know, that's the thing is because if they want you, then make it known as well. So mm-hmm. it makes you feel, you make, makes you feel not just like a person on the crew, it makes you feel really valued and wanted. Yeah. And I think that's how they, you know, that's an amazing thing. It's very funny. The first AD that, um, Peter uses uh, Caro. She, yes. we were <laughs> when we started the Hobbit. We were kind of warned, you know, like she runs a tight ship. Yeah. Watch out! And I stupidly thought that I'd got like I don't know. I think we we're about three quarters of the way through that whole doing that trilogy, yeah. and I stupidly assumed that she didn't know really who I was because I'd been staying off the radar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and all of a sudden <laughs> I'm on set and I hear this, Jamie Lee, yeah. get out of Highline. And I was like, oh, she knows my name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just yeah. hit the floor. Like I was yeah. just like, oh, Kara's yelling so at me. She, so she was still on the floor for the whole of The Hobbit because she was a producer yeah. by then. <gasps> yeah, she was doing both. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. But she, I would say, would you say to me, her and uh, Catalie Fraunfelder, who is a first AD for Tim uh, Burton, mm-hmm. they're the two best ADs I've ever worked with. Uh, you know, they're very similar, very, very similar women. And they just, it's, it's phenomenal what they do. I've never worked with the better. Yeah, I think um, coming, doing, spending, I don't know, what was it, like two, two and a half years with things being run like that and you always knew what was happening. The communication was very open. It was every, it was always done the same way each time. Um, And then go onto a set where you're like, what is happening right now? So this is where you met, this is where you met Flora, I suddenly realised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. You'll have um, to look out for Flora's episode too because I had a chat with her a little while ago. Oh, amazing. That's cool. <laughs> She's going to be an amazing designer. She is, you yeah. know. And so now everything is sort of kind of happened at the right time and the right way. That's awesome. Oh, yes. You were all <laughs> there, girls, together. Yeah. <sighs> My God. <laughs> and then did you work with Kerry on, on – um, Gatsby. No, I worked with I wish. I worked with Kerry yeah. um on Blade Runner in oh, Hungary. Oh wow. Yeah. So that's uh, that's amazing. amazing. Yeah, it was cool. That must have been amazing. Yeah. So I was going to touch on the fact yeah. that I mean I it, it will partially have something to do with where you are based and that so many period films are shot there, but you yourself have designed a lot of period films. Yeah. I was just 
going to ask you a few things about that. So I'd like to know what your favorite sources of for research are when you when you start on a job like that. Always slightly different. My sources of research are always slightly different, I would say. I've been very fortunate to have, for a very large portion of my career, I worked, collaborated with uh, the same directors again and again, like with Joe Wright, with Anthony Mangella, um, and Stephen Daldry. did a couple of films with Tim Burton. So it's always, I think, when you work with very visual directors like Joe Wright and Stephen Daldry, and even Anthony Mangella was amazingly visual, you kind of get the unusual thread that they might be thinking of or, you know, and an inspiration that takes you to a different place rather than the straight period. Okay. And that I think is always quite interesting where the research takes you. But I'm very big on books and period books and real people material. Like every time I could find any photographs or books about strange jobs that people had in whatever period it might be. Okay. Then you get to see people who are not necessarily being painted. And usually mm. that usually they are always rich people if you go to paintings and stuff. Yeah. So I try and figure out all the different kind of uh, unusual jobs that people might have had that were documented because that's that's usually is your working class people and more ordinary people and unusual looking people. Yeah. So I do spend a lot of time researching. That's one of the things that I do a lot, trying to find interesting ideas. That's brilliant. I know that not for stuff that goes way, way back, but for um, like what is it, the school – books that they put out like the class photos and yes. things like that just the, the school yeah. journals and stuff like that through the like 50s and 60s and things like that yeah quite interesting and I've come across recently yeah, um at the like the flea markets I don't know how these yeah. things end up there but um old family photo albums and this stuff that are in yeah and it's just like, I'm always standing there going, oh, this is so fascinating. And my husband's it's just like, why are you looking? That's kind of creepy. Like, <laughs> it's kind why? of creepy, it is. <laughs> and I keep them all in boxes and stuff because I can't really, you know, it has to be kind of away a little bit because it's other people, it's people's yeah. family. And you kind of wonder how did this end up here? Yeah. But it's so fascinating to look through, yeah, as you say, just the everyday people to yeah. be able to get that, I guess, that diversity and that variety within within the yeah. look of what you're what you're shooting so that's yeah yeah that's exactly awesome. yeah so that's that's kind of a try and go and then of course you know when you you know particularly joe wright is a person who would say let's let's kind of go away to um slightly kind of hoppy indians when you're doing atonement and stuff like that and you go oh my right. God, how am i going to connect the two but <laughs> it's in the volume it's in the braids it's in the movement it's you know it's all of those kind of stuff and you know and that's quite interesting when you have a director who can who's not afraid to go there yeah or thinking about those details yeah exactly exactly that's awesome um, so what has been your favorite period thus far oh god I don't think I, I don't have you like my, I can't do that <laughs> I can't do that. Well, I, it's always a little bit torturous because I have to learn it. I have to learn how to do. I mean, I have to say now over the years that, you know, I, I have learned certain things. But yeah. it is usually I have to learn how to do that particular character or that particular style or that particular person. And I, it is practice and I have to figure it out. Um mm-hmm. You know, when I did Atonement, I remember I bought an amazing hairdressing book from the 30s, which tells you exactly how to do those styles. Mm-hmm. And I would try and do them like that. And if you did them exactly as they said in the book, they would come out like that. Right. So, and Peter Owen has always been a really great help like that because that's what he did. He would get old books and learn from them. So I would say that, you know, I, every single period I get, I have to learn uh, how to do it almost from scratch because it, there's always different type of person, different people. I mean, one of the hardest films I think I've ever done period wise was a film that no one's ever seen called Goya's Ghosts. Okay. And that's the film that was the last film that Milos Forman ever made. Mm-hmm. And and the, our producer, amazing Soul Zance, um, who did 
amazing films like The English Patient and lots of incredible films. He did very few films in his career, but they're all nominated for the Best Picture Oscar. And he kind of didn't sell it when it was finished. I think right. he was starting to get a bit sick as well. Milos was very old. and He didn't sell it straight away and no one's really seen it. Apart from randomly, I get phone calls still to this day from people in different countries going, oh, my God, this film came out uh, last night. And we watched it. And it was Stellan Skarsgård as Goya, um, mm. Javier Bardem, Natalie Portman. It was like it was amazing, amazing cast. Wow. Uh, in this story of Goya, the painter, mm-hmm. through his life, which touched on two very, very French revolution, changed everything. You know, people had like tie backs and powdered hair before and then suddenly the French Revolution came and everyone cut their hair off and everything was different wow. and that was massive I remember having to burn fat into these tie bags and powder them for like four days in my hotel room Peter Owen came out to help me uh, we sat there smoking cigarettes and burning fat into the tie bags and that's how they've done them at the time and the hotel and I, must have been like what did you do i can't get what? the smell out of these drapes yeah <laughs> and peter, said, peter said if you use margarine it will smell less because it's not animal fat <laughs> so, so we use margarine instead of butter oh my goodness so that's incredible. Yeah. So you are absolutely using those original I techniques. Try, yeah. I to try create and, the looks. Yeah. Like on, on the crown, I literally spend two years standing at the end of the bus pink curling every single wig. Mm-hmm. And I pink curled absolutely every single thing was always pink curled. So we don't use any bendies or any hot sticks or anything because, you yep. know, you just. It is if you can, I think it lasts longer. You know, that's how they did it. And yeah. so it's just sometimes we can't. We have to do what we can do. Yeah. Um, but that's what I kind of try and do is figure out how it was done so I can um, make it look the same. Yeah. So those traditional techniques mm. are, yeah, definitely important. So is that the weirdest traditional technique of hair that you have done with um, burning fat, like burning melting fat? fat into- <laughs> definitely. Definitely. But when you, but when you, the thing is when you, it's the most satisfying as well, because once you've done it, it looks exactly like in the paintings. Right. It's just so laborious and it takes forever. And it's, it's so, because once you then curl it, then you have to brush it out. Then you have to re-tighten it again. And then you put powder on it that then settles into all the grooves and everything in the way that literally does in the paintings. Uh, but then you can't brush it, you can't, you know, because it's if sick. you brush it out, yeah, if you brush it out, you have to start again. So, it so is the, the fat's being used as a hair product of sorts? Like is that the point of it? Yeah. So the fat the hair into place? Yeah, and, and, and steaming through the hair with the hot irons. Wow. It's honestly, it's brutal, <laughs> but it is brilliant because it does actually make those. And also I never knew before then uh, that no wigs were white. They were only, they were natural colors, but they were powdered white. Oh, um, they were powdered. Some of them would be powdered so much so that they looked, turned white. And the gray ones looked, the gray ones looked white, white, but they were not made in white, white hair and right. you know it's, it, and then the, and the different shapes and different curls and different directions you have to go and then they become that little uh oh, it's it was it was the weirdest technique I had to learn definitely <laughs> and do you um do you do that with makeup sometimes as well like learning the traditional techniques of how they would do things to Yes, definitely. But is makeup is harder because I think makeup is evolved so much. Mm. Like when I first started, there were two uh, makeup foundations that were acceptable for film. There was Visiora and then there was Clinique. Um, some people use pan sticks still because they were so good at knowing how to apply them thinly and beautifully. Mm. But you know, now makeup is so wonderful and you can, you know, you, you almost have to become product freak to figure out what does what because there, there is a big difference and it's less maintenance 
on set and you can't, if you use the original techniques for makeup, then you, people look more caked and older and not so nice, especially yeah. on digital. Yeah. So I do love, if you can, you know, that if, if there is a kind of a theatre performance of some kind or something to do, try and do it the way they would have done it. Mm. But usually you can't really, you have to use modern products because I'm still trying, I'm still trying to learn one thing, how to do the, you know, and the, the um, hot wax onto each eyelash with a matchstick. Oh like my goodness. Man- you know that Man Ray photo of kind of tears of the close up of an eye, and every eyelash has a bubble at the end. Yes, that's that's the, that technique. That's what they did. Oh my so goodness! Wow, you get hot wax and you put it in with a matchstick on each eyelash individually, and then it would solidify at the end into a little bubble and I tried to do it for a film on false eyelashes but it didn't look right Mm. so it's something that I still have to learn how to do (laughs) oh you just have to wonder like at the time someone coming up with that and the guinea pigs (laughs) yeah and the hot wax in your eyes (laughs) yeah wow that's amazing I mean oh yeah goodness we always talk about the the pain people go through for beauty but it's been yeah. wow it was worse <laughs> back then I I would imagine yeah oh my god yeah <laughs> um and what era would you like to do that you haven't is there oh, one that you haven't done <laughs> well there yeah there is quite a few I haven't done there's a few that frighten me uh a lot like all the big cages and Marie Antoinette's and all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff yeah, I would love to do that, but that does frighten me because you'd have to figure out the pleasing way of doing it and then the right way of doing it and the cages and all that. That's definitely one. Yeah. Um, and in the 30s, you know, the 30s, this is why I absolutely admire and love Kerry Warren because he figured out how to do the 30s he was a very glamorous film, Gatsby, and it was most, you know, outlandish kind of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he did figure out how to do the proportions right and everything because it's very difficult to do uh, true 30s or, say, 20s and 30s mm. um, in real hair today because it's not prepped properly, it's not thinned out properly, so you can't or, – or, or permed. Yeah. So it's really difficult to do that in real hair. And then in the wig, again, it's quite hard because you have to have, have it thin enough, prepped enough. So when you're doing background, you can't have enough of those. Mm. And that's why I think the real genius in Kerry Warren was to figure out how to do that on mass in such huge numbers. Yeah. And I would say that's the best of that period to me. So that frightens me. I would like to do that but it's really really frightening to me to do 20s and 30s. <laughs> I, I I feel like you're the type of person that's up for a challenge though so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you'll be fine <laughs> now working with Tim Burton what was that like I'm a fan of his work absolutely as I'm sure a lot of people are and it always is I mean it definitely has a look to it do you know what I mean like yeah you can visually look at something and pretty much feel Tim Burton coming out of it so how was that to work with him well I always work with uh, Tim Burton as uh, Peter Owens key as it were um, okay. because because Peter so I haven't designed his films mm-hmm. but Peter worked with him on Edward Scissorhands I think or um, one film before even okay. so they have known each other forever but at the time when we did those films that I worked with Tim Burton Peter would just literally uh, do the fittings with me and with, with, with Tim and Colleen Atwood, a costume designer, and, and set the whole thing up. And then he'd be pretty much gone. Yeah. So it wasn't as scary because I had someone like Peter Owen there with me. I think Tim, I think Tim's so visual and knows exactly what he wants, but also is incredibly guided by Colleen Atwood. Um, so it is totally co- the collaboration with Colleen. You know, she yeah. has totally planned what makeup and hair is going to be like oh wow so it is it's it's uh, what I enjoyed the most was Sweeney Todd because that was the film that I can't remember what happened that the film that he was prepping didn't go and Mm. because Sweeney Todd didn't need a lot of time or prep we just jumped into it and um that was pretty much all decided on it. Like tomorrow we're going to do this. Can you do this? And tomorrow we're going to, you know, we need to do this effect or whatever. 
we need to shave, you know, film shaving through a beard in shot so you can see hair coming off on the blade and clean skin underneath. Yeah. Uh, and those kind of things were great because they had to figure out how to do that uh, pretty quickly, you know. Uh, Just keeping you on your toes. <laughs> So that was good. I really enjoyed that. But yeah, he is he's he's amazing, Tim Burton. You know, obviously he makes films which are all, you know, of, of a type. But um and then you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was just fun with lots of kids and yeah. so I think I did almost did two of my favourites with him, really. Oh, that's so cool. That's awesome. I was gonna to talk to you about the crown as well. So did you enjoy moving over to doing more of a series instead of a film? for a while well how did you find that exactly well that's a very good question uh well I did because I did everything with Stephen Daldry that he's ever done pretty much I didn't do one film with him in Brazil uh called Trash uh but everything else I've done we did a play in the West End Mm. that also transferred to Broadway called The Audience okay and that was a play that started off with Helen Mirren in a starring role and he wanted to make it more thrilling for the audience. He wanted the the queen to become young and old as she talks to her prime minister. The, the play is about the queen talking to 12 of her prime ministers. Okay. And she remembers her life basically through talking to them. Mm-hmm. So they come on stage and she's there whatever age she is when that prime minister w- was in power. Yeah. So when she talks to Churchill, she's very young. And when she talks to um, Cameron, she's very old. Mm -hmm. So he wanted that to happen on stage. And so we had to figure out how to do all her wig changes on stage in situ and costume changes and everything. Mm -hmm. And she had quite a few wigs because there's quite a few looks through her life. Yeah, And we managed to do it. It was great fun. And then I did it again with Chris Scott Thomas in Mm -hmm. the West End. So there was another actor, another actress, all the other, you know, and when you're setting up a show like that, the danger is that you're going to make everyone look like spitting image dolls because it is theatre. Yeah. And John Major looks funny no matter what you do. So <laughs> not to let people laugh at these actors when they come on stage. That was quite difficult. So I'd done that. Mm. And then Stephen said, I'm going to do this six seasons of this show called The Crown, which is in chronological order. And what we'll do, instead of changing one, like on the stage, changing her from young to old, we'll change the cast every two seasons. Yeah. So we'll start with the the youngest and then we'll we'll carry on. So let's do this together for six years. I was like, oh, God, I can't (laughs) imagine. That's that's difficult to, under, to to kind of give yourself to a project for six years of your life. It's, yeah, it's like, absolutely. Although many people did on on Game of Thrones quite happily, you know. Yeah. So I thought, well, let's see how this goes. And so I started on The Crown, and the show like that, it, it just they just did not have a. I think quite a lot of the time they don't have a concept how shows like that run. You learn in the first two seasons mm-hmm. how to do it. And then you change the format and everything. Yeah. But we didn't know how to do it. And also we didn't have any sets. But we didn't know we're not going to have any sets. So you suddenly now in a situation where you had to figure out, literally figure out a format of how to staff it, how to do it. And then it became obvious that one of the ways to do the show is to do double banking, which means that you have or potentially four directors shooting at the same time in wow. two different locations. Oh, wow. So you've got actors and um, you've got actors going between different locations, sometimes in South Africa, sometimes in Budapest, but mostly in this country. And you have to have enough stuff and people to follow them and have enough wigs that are set till you can get all the wigs back to the mothership and have them reset once a week. Oh, my goodness. So I had to learn because I've never heard of anything like this. Yeah. And this all developed quite slowly. They don't tell you that at the beginning. They don't tell you anything. This all just happens to us. Yeah. (laughs) Suddenly you're like, what do you mean you're double banking? Does it mean – and then what do you mean we're finishing? We're going over and we're finishing in Ely Cathedral at 11 at night, but Matt Smith with his wig needs to be on set at 5 a.m. at Elstree tomorrow. And that's like three-hour journey. And how are his wigs going to get there? Yeah. So that's when you learn that this cannot go on for two years. So 
you, I had to learn how to set that up. And that gave me a lot of pleasure because I do like a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it was scary at times because it was people's safety. You know, it was a lot of things to address. Yeah. I mean, producers never rebelled against our ideas. They were welcomed. Yeah. But I really felt the responsibility to look after people and to make sure, you know, they had to have people had to have dress wigs all the time. If they had to stay behind to dress their wigs for the next day and drive to another location, someone's going to have an accident. Yeah. So to figure out the system, how to do that show was very, very challenging, but interesting. And I think, you know, I did, at the end of the second season, I would have a sheet of paper with everyone's names on the top and their cast members going down. And I would issue that piece of paper to everyone in the team once a week. And then they would have the instructions where to go, where to be, and where to, how to handle that wig, where that wig needs to be handed to to get back to me. Oh, my goodness. So I could redress them all and resend them back to them. Yeah. And so every person would get their sheet for Monday to Friday to Saturday, whatever, and go, okay, so Monday I'm here, and then Tuesday I'll come back to you, pick up another wig, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday I have to go to this other unit. I mean – the, the Lord of the Rings did that absolutely seamlessly. You know, yeah. all your units and aerial units and everything that was organized by production, by your amazing first. And that was the first time I've seen anything like it. So that was the only experience I had of seeing that people could be sent safely with an aerial unit with a bunch of hobbits in their wigs to another <laughs> island. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Peter Jackson was looking at everything on a monitor in Wellington. That's um, crazy. But those kind of things can be done. But that was all, all hands on deck and it was organized. Everyone knew this was kind of not planned or organized. So you had to kind of be invented. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of those shows are like that because uh, people just don't know how to do them now. They're well into it and they're double banking very happily yeah. in season three and four uh, because – They've got, they've, I think they've got like four times more crew than I had. Oh, wow. So you, you just did season one and two? Yes, only season one and two. And then, okay. and then I just thought, well, you know, the Queen's hairstyle is Queen's hairstyle. Now, I, now it would just be, you know, I would get a little bit bored of doing the same for. And it's so uh, not only was it a change of cast, it was a change of hair and makeup as well. Yeah, and then Stephen Dolder is not doing it anymore, so... Yeah. You know, it just became a just a, another yeah. So they they changed, and now they're going to do only one more uh, with an old uh, queen, and that's it. Oh no! Don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good show. I, this is probably a terrible thing for someone that comes from a country whose queen is the queen. Um, but I had absolutely no interest in the royal family. No, and I know. I. I started watching that just out of curiosity and I love yeah. it. Absolutely love it. But I think it's just because I have more of an understanding of, I guess, just seeing that, you know, just being thrown into being born into that position is this is it. Yeah. so crazy. Well, that's why I, I, I didn't really want to do season later seasons because they're now getting a bit more gossipy. Right. Because there's more gossip to talk about. But the first two seasons were literally stories in history, like the fog story and stuff like that, that we don't know anything about. And I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, but having done the play and researching that family and her for so long, mm. I actually and I am a socialist. I'm not a royalist, you know. I'm mm-hmm. not, you know. I don't. But I absolutely started loving her because she has done so many amazing things for the country, for the monarchy, and that's why I think you know when she's gone, it's all going to be gone because you know who you certainly New Zealand and Australia are not that interested in being. I think everyone's interested in the Commonwealth, but she's alive because mm. she finds it the most important thing in the world. You know, she is extraordinary. And where she came from, you know, long dresses and, and, and you know, different century where people, women couldn't vote. She comes from that background and she became someone completely different. And I have a lot of um, understanding for her. The rest of the family is a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> she is... You know, she's quite a cool lady. 
That's amazing. So when you were first prepping and getting ready to shoot that first season, was it a conscious decision? Like were you using makeup appliances for anybody to do lookalike makeups or was it just a decision that was made that we are working with what we have and yeah. 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 It was a decision was made that we would do the spirit of the people involved rather than mm-hmm. lookalikes. Right. So, yeah, so it wasn't very, you know, we were not going for accurate uh, to, to try and make people look, at, you know, when you, like particularly with John Lithgow, for example, you know, there he is, six foot six, you know, huge man. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, what can you do? You know, what are the things that will, when he walks into a room, that make you realise that he's definitely Churchill? So yeah. we went for those things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, again, his Clemmy was not very much like Clemmy because uh, Juliet Walter doesn't really suit certain, you know, uh, length of hair and stuff. And so I think kind of I tried to kind of be kind to the actors in that sense rather than go for the because it is, you know, I treated it very differently in that sense than Darkest Hour, yeah. which, was, which was more of a historically accurate piece. Yeah. Talking about Darkest Hour, so that was something that was said right from the get-go that we want to try and get people, the silhouette, try and get people as close as possible to the actual historical figures. Yeah, because when Joe asked me to do the film, Gary Oldman was already very much in the works with Kazuhiro doing his prosthetics. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to do that makeup, like measuring Churchill's face and applying it to Gary's face. Right. Gary was that adamant that he can only do it if he has exactly, if his eyes are as far apart as Churchill's. And we were like, we can't do that. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> you know, he was he was that into it. So then we decided to, I, I literally had to go through the list with Joe to say, like, who knows what General Ironside looks like? Let's not bother with those kind of people. But there's a whole list of people yeah. that people didn't know what they looked like. And we did go for it there. Mm -hmm. Uh, to try and uh, make actors look exactly like the real uh, people. Yeah. But I would say it was, it ended up being half, half. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, Now you mentioned that Peter Owen is your go-to wig maker. Who does your facial hair for you? It's always Sarah Weatherburn Mm -hmm. and Peter sometimes, but lately he really hasn't had time. You know, he got so busy, uh, hasn't had time to, to make facial. So it's always Sarah Weatherburn. Yeah, that's brilliant. She does beautiful work. Yeah. And she's, you know, and she's probably now the world's best, isn't she? I think so. Still. And yeah. she's a lovely woman. So <laughs> she really is, yeah. <laughs> um, I was gonna ask you, when you're putting a team together of hair and makeup artists, what, what are you looking for in a team? Well, what becomes really quite difficult when you leave and go off and you have breaks in working at home, you then lose touch with your people that you know and work with so when I have to assemble a team from you know people I haven't worked with Mm. I think I always try and match people to the actors involved I think I always think like how you know what will they need what would they be comfortable with yeah and try and get people who would suit each other yeah so you don't get a loud person with someone who's very quiet or someone who's you know it Um, yeah, especially on the crown, that was also very important because people were together for six months Mm. or seven months. So it was really important that they fit together. And then, you know, on the show like that, your problem is that, you know, your cast number seven, who is still very high up the call sheet, they sometimes have to have different makeup artists in different episodes because there's no continuity and they actors hate it because they like the makeup artists that they get to have. And there was quite a lot of, you know, but but that's the name of the game. That's how those shows run. You know, you mm-hmm. have to do what you have to do. But you know, it's nice to. I love it when you get it right and people get on really well, and you see kind of real friendships. Looking forward to see each other every morning on the on the makeup table. Yeah, it's just the little things that will keep everybody happy. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. very cool. I was going to ask you, how do you feel the industry has changed over the years? Well, I think God, it's, it really has changed. I have sort of recently realized that it's changed a lot um, suddenly, I think. I think it's the, well, for one, you know, when we did Cold Mountain, I didn't have a computer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the whole of that film was prepped with the paper trail of documents. Yeah. And that was 2001. 
that's only 19 years ago. You could do a whole film, six months mm. work on two different continents with actors coming from all over the uh, all over the place without having email and a computer. Yeah. So I think that would be, you know, now because of that, we have, I think we also have less prep because we are trying to maximize everyone's efficiency, I think, has become, mm. efficiency has become the main task. So you shoot in the most optimum time level, prep is the same. But that means that we don't get as much time, definitely we don't get as much time to prep. Yeah. What was usual is that when the cast were approved, they would see makeup and hair in costume for one session without having to have their contracts finalized. Mm -hmm. So we could get in quite early and then the contracts were being finalized for quite a while later. That does not happen anymore. Oh no. So you now have to you wait till <laughs> So that's a huge change for us. Yeah. I think that's a huge change. You can't talk to those actors and you can't start. No, it makes a huge difference time-wise, doesn't it? Yeah. And when I did you know, when I did a, f a film called Steve Jobs, I remember making wigs um, for a very, very prominent character in that based on, on someone else's block because from pictures uh, on the internet, I was like, their heads look similar. I'm just going to make these wigs because I don't get to see him. Wow. I'm going to make these wigs. And mm. Peter and I were looking, Peter, we agreed, and they fit perfectly. Oh, and brilliant. <laughs> that, but it's a risk. Yeah. It's a huge risk. And also the styles were easy. So you can actually have a little bit of discrepancy somewhere. But if you had a more difficult style or a cut, mm. it would be impossible. So this yeah. lends itself. But that happens to me all the time now that you have to start your prep um you know sometimes most of the time lately when i had to redo things in the wigs is because i had to make them or cut them mm. before i would have a session with the actor wow because you have to cut them because you have to have something to look at quite often it'll be too short mm -hmm. not quite often it happened to me a few times yeah which never happened before because you just have to do it and if, you know, if the actor's sitting there with an uncut wig, mm. no one can imagine what that's going to look like. That's kind of the worst thing. Yeah. And I had it on Rebecca and I had to, you know, I had to present a wig that was shooting almost, you know, a few days later and I had to cut it and it was too short. And then mm. I had to get Peter to put more hair in the bottom. I mean, it's never right when you do that. No. So those were, I would say the optimal you know just striving towards the biggest efficiency is cost us I think quite a bit of ability to do our job comfortably like to prep because I think in preparation is everything and yeah. all the clever stuff that I've seen comes from preparation no yeah. one's ever come up with anything really clever without it taking two or three goes and that goes for costume and definitely for us yeah you know, everything takes a bit of a thought search try an error and then you go right I know I know what it's going to be yeah and then it's something else I was talking to um Peter Swords King the other day and he was talking about having wigs made and yeah. being able to have a uh, fitting just once the foundation of the wig was made and I was like yeah. oh my goodness yeah. stop it like yeah how often is that going to happen yeah and <laughs> especially if you're in another country um yeah but yeah. I was just like, oh, that makes so much sense, though, to be able to have, yeah. you know, do the head wrap and then, you know, once the yeah. foundation's made, to fit mm -hmm. that to see that it's okay before kicking into um, popping yeah. all the hair into it. But I was just like, oh, what a treat I that know. would be. <laughs> I know. And how many times now, I mean, all the small characters you can do out of your, you know, bag of wigs or whatever. Mm. But it, you need 300 to be able to possibly find one that's right. You have to have a huge stock and that's yeah. sometimes really impossible to pay for. They won't pay to hold all those wigs for fittings where I used to be able to, and now that it's busier, mm. you can't take wigs out of wig shops because they will go out and be rented. So you can't have that ability anymore. <laughs> Yeah, it's very true. Working in the States have noticed that oh, there's a huge lack of wig rental here. Oh. The amount of times I end up contacting 
Peter Owen or Alex yeah. Rouse to read yeah. wigs and you know it's yeah. worth it to have them shipped over here yeah it's quick them. it's amazing but and then the people that do rent them here it's a lot of the time it's two or three times the cost that they're charging yeah. so I'm like yeah. well, I'll just go to <laughs> I'll just go to the UK and get and rent those wigs. It's it's quite exactly. amazing. Someone really needs to work on their wig stock in the states to get themselves a big, big rental. That's interesting, yeah. And I do think that's you know that I think that people used to keep their wigs. I mean, I'm talking about a long time ago. You know, yeah. People just used to keep wigs after the show. Yeah. Because they would get lost and stuff, and now everything is different. Now they it gets embargoed differently and stuff. So people, you know, not many, many wigs go back into the wig stock to be rented. No, they just sit in storage somewhere in a box. Yeah. So sad. Yeah. <laughs> Such a sad, sad. Need to Which start is, a campaign to release the wigs. <laughs> release the wigs. Release the wigs from, from terrible storage. Yeah. Death. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. Um, now, Ivana, what is the one tool or product that you would not want to work without? I know there's many. But I just want you to think of one. Well, I suppose it's a tail comb. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, I have to be oh, honest. Mine is comb. mine is a tail comb and and, and hairspray. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm like don't comb, don't really. take my tail comb and my little um, on set little spray oh, yeah. sprayer away yeah. from me because ah. it's so true, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's everything. <laughs> yeah do you have a favorite type of tail comb because I know that I use a certain brand that I've tried to use other brands and I just can't move past the one that I like the L net all the way the hairspray or the tail comb yeah oh sorry tail comb no no hairspray yeah um, hairspray hairspray Expert Elnet and Telcom? No, I think I do Sally's um you know whatever I get in Sally's okay um in Telcom yeah no, I'm so Would funny. I'm so particular about my tail comb. It's hilarious. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I pick up a different one. I'm like, no, the weight's different. The proportion's yes. different. I can't I can't deal with it. It's so yeah. funny how yeah. fussy you become. Um, yeah. And now who would you like to hear on the podcast? Well, I think someone like Naomi Dawn will be very, very interesting. I think so too. I just met her briefly recently for the Oscars symposium when she was yeah. talking about 1917, yeah. Because I just think she's done so, you know, from the Bonds to all the, you know, BBC days and mm-hmm. and um, she did all the comedy shows and French and Saunders and all that sort of stuff Yeah. to all the Bonds. You know, there's such a body of work there. Oh, that'd be cool. Uh, yeah. I think so too. Thank you, Ivana. It has been so brilliant chatting with you. Oh, brilliant. I really enjoyed this. Thank you, Jamie Lee, so much. For links to see more of Ivana's work, go to our Instagram at The Last Looks Podcast or the episode notes page on our website, thelastlookspodcast.com. The Last Looks Podcast would like to thank Brett Stanley and Sabrina Castro. The song Fun Time by DJ Quads. Thanks for listening. Until next time. That's a wrap, people.